Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So today we will be talking about tissue dynamics. We have been talking about cell culture and uh, looked at how cells initially had to be harvested, isolated and uh, cultured and even differentiated. I hope the assignment gave you an idea of what differentiation is and uh, how complicated directed differentiation can be. Because achieving differentiation is not too difficult actually. If you are talking about just differentiation, then all you do is expose them to some stress condition and it will just differentiate to some random cells and mostly it will just differentiate to something which is uh, very prevalent like a fibroblast or something. But if you want some specific directed differentiation then it is quite complicated and it can actually be quite tricky. Okay. So uh, having discussed uh, some of those things let us move on to tissue dynamics. So tissues actually can exist in three dynamic states, uh, tissues are actually not static, they can uh, change in their uh, state status and uh, do you know what the dynamic states are? You might have studied it in cell biology. I so it is homeostatic which is when uh, it is at normal steady state functioning. So this uh, tissue is doing what it is supposed to do and uh, it is just existing in the system. So why do you think understanding this? Uh, tissue homeostasis is important from a tissue engineering perspective. We generally would prefer the tissues in this condition. Okay. So, we ultimately the tissue has to exist in this condition after implantation, right. So, it is important to understand what its role is, what exactly it is doing, how the cells should behave and so on, so that we can try to achieve it in our tissues. The next step is tissue repair, so which is uh, where any wounded tissue actually displays a healing process and uh, why do you think understanding this is important from a tissue engineering perspective? Uh, implant could get damaged that is one thing but you would actually be creating a wound for during implantation you many a times right. So, if in, there are uh, things like in situ forming hydrogels or injectable hydrogels those things are not exactly going to cause wounds but in many cases you are going to cause wounds and the healing can actually uh, influence how the tissue in, uh, integrates with your uh, engineered tissue. So, it is important to understand this process as well. The last one is the formation or development. Okay. So, uh, this is where it is basically uh, the initial formation of the tissue, the original tissue being formed which can be understood by studying developmental biology and morphogenesis. Why do you think this is important? not just how to grow the tissue it like how to create the tissue right. So, it is see how they will migrate and so on. Yeah. So, uh, how they will behave in general is unknown, but see uh, with respect to tissue formation whatever you studied uh, whatever you did in the assignment for uh, differentiation that comes from developmental biology. It does not, uh, so people do not just say okay I will throw these growth factors and see what happens right. You try to understand how the tissue actually develops when uh, an embryo is uh, developing into a whole organ, uh, a whole organism and during that process they try to understand what are all the uh, signaling pathways which are involved in the tissue development, what are the molecules which are involved and try to use these molecules to direct the differentiation. So, understanding this can help you. Uh, to create tissues especially if you are going to be using uh, stem cells and you are going to direct differentiation. Okay. So, these are the actually the three dynamic states. So, it kind of falls with whatever you had uh, guessed. So, if you are going to talk about tissue homeostasis, uh, tissue can actually some tissues would be in the homeostatic state for a long period whereas, some tissues are quite prolific and they keep uh, getting replenished regularly. So, uh, do you can you guess what are the most prolific tissues in your body? Skin is one of the most prolific tissues, yes. Uh, anything else? Liver can regenerate, but it is not that it uh, keeps replenishing itself again and again. 
yeah mucosal layer the intestinal uh, layer is one which actually gets uh, replenished regularly anything else what do you think would be the most prolific N yeah, neither of those is blood. not exactly blood cells but bone marrow so bone marrow is one of the most dynamic tissues in your body so it might actually get replaced very quickly and the second most uh, prolific tissue is the villi of the small intestine which is the uh, mucosal layer which is present on the small intestine uh, so here the cellular content can actually turn over every 5 days and um, the third most prolific is the skin and so the net proliferation rate can actually vary based on uh, the region of your body and uh, the turnover is in the order of a few weeks so that is homeostasis and uh, see every tissue has its own homeostasis we will not get into individual homeostasis because it is different for the type of tissue you are going to work with. So however the repair process is more uniform right so it is something which, uh, which is common for any tissue which you are talking about. So when a tissue is injured the healing process that uh, usually varies with age starts. So there are two types of healing you have the fetal wound healing which is rapid and leads to restoration of scarless uh, tissue and uh, you have postnatal uh, healing which is slower and it also leads to scarring it is that is why many of us uh, would not have uh, like scars from when we were very little right unless it was a real bad gash you had you are probably not going to have scars from uh, whatever injuries you faced when you were a one, one year old and all of us go through that right and but none of us have the scars because the healing process is actually uh, changes as you uh, age and uh, if you are in your teens or your later uh, young, young adulthood whatever scar, uh, wound you create the scars are going to be much more lasting. So the postnatal tissue healing is uh, slower and it leads to scarring. So uh, wound healing follows a sequence of events it is actually a very sequential process it is very well controlled and uh, that actually makes sure that uh, the damaged tissue gets repaired to form a healthy tissue. This is a YouTube video I would like you to watch so it is about a 4 minute video it explains the uh, healing process with good animation. Uh, it it is better to learn from this than to for me to explain it. So just have a look at the process. The key cell responsible for this function is the platelet which causes the body to form a clot to prevent further bleeding. There is an increased aggregation of platelets to enable the wounded vessel to complete the clotting process. Platelets also release key cytokines such as platelet derived growth factor that call in cells to participate in later phases of healing. The objective of the hemostasis phase of wound healing is to control bleeding. Following hemostasis, the inflammatory phase begins. The local signs and symptoms that occur during the inflammatory phase are swelling, increased fluid, profusion of blood, redness, release of epinephrine and histamine, heat, histamine response, and pain. The inflammatory phase is characterized by a host of cells, leukocytes and macrophages, infiltrating the wound sites. Bleeding is controlled by hemostasis, and bacteria that is present is destroyed by leukocytes, particularly the pump or nuclear neutrophils. About four days after the injury, macrophages want to destroy bacteria, cleansing the wound of cellular debris. Macrophages replace the leukocytes and produce a host of cytokines and growth factors. These act as chemoattractants to other cells needed for tissue repair. Macrophages also convert macromolecules into the amino acids and sugars necessary for wound healing. It is thought that the macrophage also attracts contractual cells to the wound to encourage wound contraction. Vasodilation would result in edema, warm, and rubber are the result of factors secreted from the macrophage and other leukocytes present at the wound site in response to the inflammatory process. The objectives of the inflammatory phase of wound healing are to clean debris and bacteria and prevent infection. Scar tissue formation is characterized by three distinct phases, granulation, contraction, epithelialization. Click on one of the phases to learn more. In an open wound, granulation tissue is generated, 
producing red, beefy, shiny tissue with a granular appearance. This tissue consists of fibroblasts, capillaries, and neutrophils. As this type of tissue proliferates, fibroblasts stimulate the production of collagen, which gives tissue its typical strength and structure. As the, as the wound site fills with granulation tissue, its margins contract or pull together, decreasing the size of the wound. The extent of contraction is dependent upon the mobility of the surrounding tissue. During the epithelialization, the final step of this phase, cells migrate from the wound margins, divide, and ultimately touch one another, secret the wound. Epithelialization can only occur in the presence of viable vascular tissue. Epithelial cells will not migrate across a dry surface or the chronic tissue. During the maturation phase, the collagen fibers reorganize, remodel, and mature, gaining tensile strength. Collagen fibers, proteoglycans, and fibrodentin are rearranged and redistributed. The scar becomes less cellular and gains tensile strength. However, this tissue will always be at risk of a breakdown because its tensile strength is less than that of uninjured skin. Collagen synthesis begins with the fibroblast, which secretes pro-collagen. Growth of the pro-collagen fibers is a complicated process. Macrophage and platelets are key growth factors in the development of pro-collagen. Pro-collagen fibers mature into collagen fibro. The fibros then link together into a very strong, look-like collagen fiber. There are about 10,000 fibrils interconnected within a single collagen fiber. Research is currently underway to determine the chemical details associated with collagen synthesis. Okay, so, uh, so as you saw the general thing is it is quite logical right first stop the blood and uh, then there is an inflammation phase which actually is a phase where you feel the pain and so on and then you have a uh, granulation proliferation phase where there is granulation tissue formation and uh, uh, collagen deposition and so on and then finally epithelialization and the healing process. So this actually makes sure that any tissue can be healed. So uh, in impaired conditions one, is one of these phases can get prolonged. So for example, in diabetic uh, wound healing the inflammation phase is actually prolonged. That is why it ends up becoming a chronic wound rather than it healing it uh, healing within a period of time. So, uh, trying to treat these aspects can help you. So, even if you are going to develop a, a tissue engineered, uh, an engineered tissue, you might actually have to uh, consider having some growth factors which will help in the healing process so that there will be a better host integration and so on. Okay. In case of fetal wound, wound healing, the process is much faster and it is quite effective and there is no scar formation. The overall steps which are the overall four steps which are involved are similar to that of adult wound healing. However, the individual mechanisms are different. Uh, what happens is in fetus, the gap in the epidermis is closed by contraction of a rapidly assembled actin per string. So, basically it is like a zipping up of the wound. Whereas, in case of adult wound healing, the epithelial cells actually crawl over the exposed substratum and then close the defect. So, this is a slower process uh, to do that and uh, the inflammatory response uh, in case of fetal wound healing is actually minimal. So, the inflammatory phase is quite short and the process goes on quickly. The collagen matrix uh, has a basket weave form compared to the uh, bundles which you see in adults. So, that is one of the reasons you have uh, lesser scarring when it comes to fetal wound healing. So, the composition of the ECM is also different. Uh, you have collagen 3 and uh, hyaluronic acid in fetal wound healing, whereas it is primarily fibronectin in uh, adults. So, those are the differences in fetal wound healing versus adult wound healing. So, uh, whenever we talk about tissues, the tissues can actually, uh, tissues are basically made of cells, right. So, uh, the tissue dynamics depends on uh, what the cells are doing. So, there are five cellular processes which actually regulate uh, tissue dynamics. So, can you again guess what those five could be? What could the cells be doing? Okay, grow, sorry what was it? Differentiation, yes, proliferation or growth, okay, that is cell death. So, we will just call it, so those are the biological aspects of cell death, but 
we have cell proliferation or growth you have cell death uh, you said cell differentiation what else would a cell do when it is present in a tissue so it basically can divide differentiate adhere migrate or die okay and uh, based on what it does the tissue dynamics will change and you are going to have cell populations which are going doing different things uh, in the same tissue at varying stages right so there will always be some cells which are adhered some which are migrating some which are div dividing and some dying and so on okay so we'll go through quickly about fundamentals related to division and death because that is something most of us would be familiar with because we would have studied it either as part of cell biology when it comes to mammalian cells or as part of bi microbiology and biochemistry when you are talking about uh, my bacterial cells so the principles are still the same so we'll just quickly go through them so uh, cell division basically we talk about mitotic cell division so meiotic uh, is not really relevant for tissue engineering so that's just formation of gametes which has nothing to do with creation of tissues at least for uh, from this perspective so we'll, in a mitotic cell cycle you actually have uh, four phases so you have the g1 phase uh, which is where the cells are actually present and doing their job uh, and this can have a variable time and you have the s phase which takes about uh, 8 hours which is the period in which the dna synthesis happens and uh, here the chromosome duplication and everything is done and then finally and then you have the g2 phase which takes about 2 to 3 hours so in the g2 phase you have um, the cells which have the duplicated uh, chromosomes they have two sets of chromosomes present and it moves to the m phase uh, which is where the mitosis or cell division actually happens the chromosomes are separated and the cells are divided to form two different cells and two daughter cells and the time taken for s g2 and m phases together is about 12 hours and uh, s g2 and m is zeroth order kinetics it does not depend on uh, the number of cells which is present it is going to just depend on the process itself right so this is so although overall cell division can be dependent on the cell number this particular phases is not dependent on the cell number it is dependent on the processes which have to take place for the cell division to happen okay so this is what uh, cell division is i'm pretty sure you have studied this in cell biology and uh, so when we talk about uh, these phases what happens is the cell moves from one phase to another in a unidirectional fashion uh, which is controlled by checkpoints right so it cannot after it duplicates uh, its chromosomes it cannot say no i'll go back to g1 it's not possible it has to go to uh, m uh, m phase or it has to die those are the only options right so that's because uh, you have checkpoints so do you know what are the checkpoints after g1 okay after s okay Okay. After uh, G two, it checks about the original cells. Okay. And after G one, it checks about the um, like raw materials for synthesis are available. Okay. Whether the cell is ready for division. Okay. So G one checkpoint is basically to verify if the cell is large enough, whether the environment is favorable, whether the cell already has any error in its DNA. So if if it is already a DNA with some error, it uh, sorry a cell with some DNA error. it's not going to get uh, divided so g2 cell again it verifies uh, whether the cell has become is big enough for accommodating all this and whether the duplication uh, of dna has actually happened and whether this is fully complete and you have two proper sets of dna and then the final checkpoint is your m checkpoint or metaphase checkpoint where you verify if all the chromosomes are attached to the mitotic spindle whether all the organelles are in proper shape and you make sure that this happens before the division happens these are the three checkpoints to ensure that the cell division happens properly and uh, when one of these checkpoints fail you end up with uh, damaged cells which can end up being cancerous and so on okay so when you talk about uh, cell division this again comes back to simple growth rate and growth kinetics so cell division uh, can be modeled and a growth rate is basically directly proportional to the number of cells uh, present 
uh, in the cycle at a given point of time. So, you have dx dt equals mu x where uh, mu is the specific growth rate and uh, dx dt is the growth rate. Okay. So, uh, dx dt equals mu x and you have uh, x e so this can be solved to get x equals x naught uh, e power mu t and uh, growth rate mu is would be equal to ln 2 by T d where T d is the doubling time. So, I hope everybody can derive that uh, you should have done it. Anyways, so uh, the doubling time for most of the cells which is present in your humans is about uh, 24 hours. So, basically the cells grow very slowly mammalian cells are not like E coli right. What is the doubling time for E coli? It is uh, almost 13. 20 minutes, it is roughly 20 minutes. So, it uh, it doubles very very rapidly whereas mammalian cells are going to grow at a very slow rate. Because of this we have one advantage with mammalian cell culture can you guess what it would be compared to uh, bacterial cell culture. One of the major limitations in bacterial cell culture is not a big problem in mammalian cell culture. So, uh, however, uh, with respect to mammalian cells it is not like the uh, cells can keep dividing to get to very large numbers. In bacterial cell you start with a very small inoculum and it can multiply for hours and you would be able to get very large numbers uh, provided you maintain the nutrient concentration and so on. Right. So, here that is not really possible because the even if you have nutrient uh, supply there is only limited space for the cells to grow. So, there can always be uh, limitations with respect to how much cell population can be achieved. So, because of that uh, the equation actually can get a little trickier when you are modeling cell division which would become instead of dx dt equals mu x it will be dx dt equals mu x times 1 minus x by x max. So, which gives you a, an upper limit where x max is the maximum cell density achievable for the conditions you have. So, growth rate uh, the specific growth rate mu can actually be a function of many variables uh, it could be dependent on uh, ox uh, growth factors, nutrient supply, oxygen concentration and so on. In many cases it is not uh, like a dependent on one limiting substrate. So, if it is limit uh, based on influenced on one limiting substrate then you can use monad model to model it. However, uh, in many cases there might be multiple things which are limiting the rate at which the mammalian cells are growing. So, this is the monads model and uh, monads model is the equation similar to uh, enzyme kinetics. So, um, growth rate with respect to mammalian cells uh, does not always have to be uh, like first order like what we started with it in growth rate can also be 0 order and you might have to model it appropriately. Okay. So, the uh, whatever mathematical description we have is uh, completely phenomenological and uh, you would need experiments to quantify these coefficients and gen in general the doubling time of the human cells can range anywhere from 12 hours to 30 hours. So, 12 hours would be for uh, progenitor cells and uh, as this as you have uh, cells which are less proliferative you will have increased doubling time. Uh, there can also be uh, cells with much larger doubling time but uh, those are exceptions. So, um, in general the maximum achievable cell density uh, is somewhere between 3 to 5 lakh cells per square centimeter. So, that is dependent on the size of each of these cells when they are adhered to the surface. The cell, de cell density can reach up to uh, 10 million cells per cubic uh, centimeter if the reactor system is very well designed. So, that is why you have the spinneret flasks and things where you can actually have uh, very high concentration of cells which are growing. So, uh, in some cases the cell division uh, can only be modeled if we describe the uh, status of the cells itself because see not all cells are going to divide right. See by even when you do bacterial cell culture what do you do you make sure that everything starts off at log phase you make sure cells in log phase are the ones you are studying for understanding growth kinetics right. But in mammalian cells people do that as well people can actually stop cell, cell cycle arrest it at one phase and then start them proliferating. So, that all of them are uniform or you could also have uh, things where they are in different phases. So, if you have to account for that then the model would also have to account for that then you end up with a partial differential equation which would take uh, the cell density changing with respect to time and cell density also varying with respect to the cell uh, the cell cycle status. 
So, A is the cell cycle status. So, if you have X, uh, excess T of A, T and A, then uh, A is basically the variable which describes the cell cycle status, where A equals 0 would be a newborn uh, cell and A equals 1 would be the cell which is right about completing mitosis. So, it can range anywhere in between depending on which phase the cell is in. So, cells can also be uh, lost from the cell cycle. So, this uh, if you are going to have that then you have to account for uh, the balance uh, taking into account alpha of A into X where alpha of A would be the rate of loss of cells in that particular state. Okay. So, this is not exactly cell death this is more of weeding of cells from that particular state. So, you could also have cell death cells can die for different reasons uh, cells, cells die from tissue damage which is necrosis cells also undergo programmed cell death which is called apoptosis. So, uh, apoptosis is actually a major part of tissue development. So, apoptosis itself was first discovered in 1842, but it was rediscovered in 1972 people did not really bother to follow it up after that and then they realized it was a crucial part of tissue development. There are different phases in apoptosis you have the induction phase. Uh, so, this depends on the specific cell death in uh, specific death inducing signals which are sent to the cells and then you have the effector phase where a central executioner is activated and the cell basically commits suicide and uh, you have the degradation phase where the uh, biochemical and morphological changes are happening as the cell is getting degraded. So, the cell death process can also be mathematically modeled in a similar way to the uh, cell division. It is except that the rate will be negative compared to the positive of uh, cell division. Okay. So, this gives us the brief introduction on the uh, couple of processes. There are also other uh, cellular processes which we will talk about. We will talk in detail about cell differentiation and uh, also about cell adhesion and migration. Okay. We will talk about how these can also be mathematically modeled. Okay. Thank you.